and welcome to your healthier choice. I am Dr. Robin McMurray and we are coming to you live from our studios at ACTN. On tonight's program, we're going to be discussing orthopedics, more specifically, knee pain. With me in studio tonight is Dr. Trevor Sipol. Dr. Sipol is a consultant surgeon at the San Fernando General Hospital. Dr. Sipol is also based at Gulfview Medical Center in Laramie. As usual tonight, our number should come up at the bottom of your screens, and we'll do our very best to answer each and every question during the program. So guys, let's get the show going. Let's talk about bones and joints, and let's say hello to Dr. Trevor Sipol. Dr. Sipol, welcome to Your Health, Your Choice. It's a pleasure to have you. Good evening, Dr. O'Brien. <laughs> thank you very much to you and your team for having me here. You're and, very welcome. And Trevor. in advance, thanks to the viewing audience for listening. You're very <laughs> welcome. You're very welcome. So, Trevor, um, orthopedics is a big field, massive field. Um, however, um, knee pain. Knee pain is a real common problem, and it's a, a, like one of the most common presentations for people to seek medical care, whether it be privately or publicly, whether it be to the GP, whether it be to the specialist, whether it be to the hospital. So Trevor, I, I thought it was really important tonight to put out the information to, the, to, to our patients at home about knee pain, so that they have more information and they'll be better informed, they can make better decisions. All right. So Trevor, if you could just like really start us off with just telling us about the different causes of knee pain. However, I want to structure it a little bit. If we could start up in knee pain in the population that is over 65 years old. So, so Trevor, if you could take it from there, what's the common causes of knee pain in the over 65s? Um, and how do we go about assessing it? And how do we go about helping those patients? Thank you very much, Robin. As you say, knee pain affects throughout the, the ages. But focusing on the over 65 year old age group, mm -hmm. really and truly the most dominant cause is arthritis. Arthritis. And uh, simply put, it is wear and tear of the joint. As the patient or persons get older, you're going to have wear and tear and you're going to develop some degree of arthritis. Okay. Um, in addition to that, arthritis comes in, in different forms. Mm -hmm. And in our country, we also have a high population of what we call rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. And um, with rheumatoid arthritis, you can get premature aging of the joint. All right, so let me just, just stop you there for a second, Trevor. Is it that, um, is knee pain the most common cause of, of, of joint pain in, in Trinidad and Tobago? It is. All right, and is arthritis the most common cause of knee pain? Definitely. All right, <laughs> so um, after arthritis, what is the other, the other common causes for our patients to present? So in the old age group, as we were discussing, yes. the gout is also another very common occurrence. Mm -hmm. um, and in our population, we do like to eat and consume various products that uh, are acidic in nature, um, ranging from things like sugars and alcohol, soft drinks and wines and meats. Yeah. So we do have a, a high incidence of gout okay. that can occur in the, the older population. Okay. Um, those are the two common causes? The most two common causes in the, in the older age groups. Right. In terms of arthritis itself, if you could put up slide number eight. Yeah. What, what are, that's, that's the... Um... That's looking at what exactly is arthritis. Okay. So we have two, two slides here. Yeah. One on the left and one on the right. The one yes. on the left is a picture. The one on the right is a picture of an x-ray. Right. And what you can see is the joints depicted showing normal and not so normal next to it. Right. And the, the contours and the smoothness of the normal joint are evident on both pictures to the left. Yes. And then to the right of each one, you see that the joint looks roughened and distorted right. and uh, angulated. So arthritis is sort of wear and tear. Yeah. And when we look at the patients themselves, they have knobbly looking knees and they come and say that their knees are either knocking together or spreading apart or becoming deformed with time. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And then slide number 18. This is gout, is it? We'll show you the gout. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, that's it there. So gout, gout presents, typically a patient with gout will come with a pain in the big toe, and that's yeah. one of the typical incidences that we see, yeah. but also the ankle and the knee. Uh, it doesn't okay. always look as angry as it looks in the picture there. Sometimes mm -hmm. it can be rather innocent looking. Mm -hmm. And we often resort to doing a blood test to test the acid levels, mm -hmm. which can partly at least diagnose gout in these patients. Okay. 
Okay. And um, so other than, than, than rheumatoid arthritis and gout, what, what, other, what other major conditions is it that, that people present with, with knee pain in the over 65s? Really and truly, those are the, the, the two major about, conditions. About osteoarthritis. The, so the osteoarthritis and the rheumatoid arthritis and the gouty arthritis, mm -hmm. they all relate to arthritis. Okay. And the most common one is the osteoarthritis, which is okay. the old age arthritis or the de degenerative arthritis. Okay. And so arthritis in itself is, is one of the most common causes. Indeed. indeed. So, so Trevor, so someone like this comes with, with let's say, the over 65 um, female lady at home, and they're getting a lot of pain, and they come into the hospital tomorrow morning, they say they get this sort of programming, they need to see the doctor about their painful knee. What happens to them then? What, what, what next happens to them when they go into the hospital with these painful knees? The key thing really, I think, is that patients and doctors alike nearly need to communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. And it's important that you relate to your doctor and your doctor takes time to relate to you mm -hmm. in terms of the location of your pain, mm -hmm. the type of pain you're experiencing, and how it relates really to your daily activities. Right. Because the treatment for somebody who is young and active and, and working Yes. In a high demand job, a yes. high physical demand job, yeah. will be entirely different to somebody who is somewhat older and retired right. and wants to simply enjoy certain aspects of their life. Right. So treatments really need to be tailored to, to the individual. All right. So um, well, what investigations would, you, would, you, would your patient expect at the over 65s when they come in? So that's a very um, interesting question because mm. with the advances in technology, everybody seems to know about and wants to get an MRI scan. Right. And an MRI scan is indeed a, a fantastic investigation, a very useful investigation. Yeah. But in orthopedics, many and indeed most conditions, and especially arthritis, yeah. can be in the over 60s, can be diagnosed with a plain x-ray. Okay. And that will give us enough information most times right. in the over 60 age group. Okay. As to the diagnosis, like as to what causes any pain. That's right. All right. Um, I suppose you have to do blood tests as well. So blood tests do play some part, um, mm -hmm. especially as we were talking about the uric acid for yeah. detecting gout. Yeah. And there are particular blood tests in relation to identifying rheumatoid arthritis and related type disorders. So a number of tests can can be useful there. Mm -hmm. And. As always in our population, one should always do or check for diabetes. Mm -hmm. Not that it has that much bearing on the arthritis itself, mm -hmm. but overweight is a, a big problem and weight loss definitely helps with improving quality of life and reducing pain levels in arthritis. Okay. All right, Trevor. So, yeah, um, so the patient comes in, you, we do an x-ray, you kind of talk to the patient, kind of determine whether it's an arthritis type condition, whether it be osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis that's causing the pain or gout. Um, what do we do for the patient? How do we help them? So our surgeons, How do you help them? Our surgeons like to divide things into surgical and non-surgical. Yeah. So in terms of, of non-surgical... And this is strictly the over 65, it's not the Over 65, yeah. yes. So in terms of non-surgical, if we could pull up on uh, slide 25. Yeah, we can still talk. So the, the, the slides, this is just a slide really to show you that mm -hmm. there are many, many supplements on, on the market. Right. And some of these may work, some may not work. And like anything... You know, it, it really depends on the individual, it depends on the amount of arthritis, it depends on the product itself. Mm -hmm. And I don't tell patients that these will definitely help them, mm -hmm. but I do tell them that they may be of some help. And indeed, mm -hmm. these products are not poisonous. Mm -hmm. They are designed as supplements. Right. So if nothing else, they, they won't harm you. What are the supplements? Are they, are they, what, what is the active components of these supplements? Are this like the glucosamine and the chondrontin that we hear about and the um, omegas? What, what are the active ingredients? That's right. So they're, they're all sort of based on chondroitin, glucosamine, and something mm. called hyaluronic acid, okay. which are all components of cartilage, right. um, which is what is the smooth surface of the knee and what makes up the joint and allows it to act like a bearing, like a cow or any other, to keep right. the surface smooth. All right, so, so Trevor, a lot of our patients at home um, who come into the office would be on these supplements already. Um, so you're saying that these supplements help them? Indeed. Okay. Indeed. All right, so you're on these supplements, what other type of treatments would, would they get in the hospital when they come to see you? So we, we talk and we discuss weight loss is important, as mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, Why braces, is weight loss important? The, 
Without a doubt, the knees take a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. You know, unlike your upper limbs, you can choose how to use them. But once you're walking, you have to walk around your hips, knees, ankles. Mm -hmm. And the forces are actually multiplied at the knee mm -hmm. in terms of that weight. And if you have deformity, the forces can be even more. So simply losing five, ten pounds can actually take a significant load off the knees. Okay. And not get rid of the arthritis, yeah. but ease the amount of pain control. that you experience. All right, so you, you talk to the patient, talk to them about weight loss, mm -hmm. um, what else? Some patients will benefit from the use of a, a brace. Right. All right. And these braces have various shapes and designs. So I think you have a slide with we those braces. have a slide braces. on number 29. Mm -hmm. So there are many different designs and some are more restraining or constraining than others. Mm -hmm. For the majority of patients, though, the one in the center is probably the best value for money and most effective. Mm -hmm. So it's designed as a sleeve with a hole in the center to keep the kneecap. Right. And it has adjustable straps to get the tension right so it doesn't slip down from the knee when you're trying to move around or exercise right. as the case may be. Right. So this, what, what about the, um, that brace there on the top right hand corner with the sort of metal um, support? Is that useful? So the, from left to right, Because these sometimes are, it's hard for the patients to know which brace to, to, to get. Indeed. Sometimes the doctor tells the patient, go and get a brace, and, and the patient is stuck there not knowing which one to get. So since, if, if I might, if, if you might indulge me a little bit. Yeah, so the, the one to the immediate left, yes. you know, that's a very simple brace. It's just a sleeve that you pull on. Yes. And that, that tends to get slack very quickly. Mm -hmm. It doesn't hold the knee at all. Mm -hmm. The next one along has a hole for the kneecap. So mm -hmm. that's kind of better, mm -hmm. but also that slips away. Okay. Then you have the one that I discussed that I, I find the most effective. Yes. And then as you move across, the other two have hinges, one hidden yes. and, and one visible. Yes. Now those hinges are good when you have ligamentous injuries. Okay. And to some extent, they can work for arthritic patients, but okay. I find that for most patients, yes. especially if you don't have a typical body shape or habitus, yes. those hinges tend to cut in and feel un uncomfortable. Especially for the older age group. Indeed. And it sort of ends up being counterproductive. Okay. So you say in general, the one in the center there would probably be the best for our patients at home? For the vast majority, yes. If All you right. had to pick something up without consulting a doctor, that would be the one I would, okay. would choose. So our patients at home, they're on the supplements, they get a nice knee brace for their, for their knee. Those are important steps that sometimes people overlook, mm -hmm. but these are just part of the pyramid of, of treatments. Yes. What, what else we could do at home or, or gently in the clinic to help our patients with knee pain? Any other conservative treatments, I'd say? Um, simple say. physical exercise, aided by physiotherapy mm -hmm. so you know we, we we talk about joints will seize up if we don't use them and there is some truth in that okay. you know and it's a term that we use and say you know if you don't use it it's going to seize up and get stiff and when you're ready to use it it, it won't work right. and there is some truth in that so okay. keep yourself mobile even if it's just a little bit of walking or a little bit of cycling you have these um i can't remember the name now but there's this little cycle that you sit down yeah. and pedal yeah. from a seated position yeah. Some sort of exercise to, to keep you going. To and keep the mobility in the joint. Keep the mobility, yes. And physiotherapists mm. can help with that as well. Okay. Visits to the physiotherapist can aid things along. Okay. Um, so, all right, so that's nice supplemental treatment. But the fact is, a lot of patients in pain, is, what, what, do we, what do they do for the pain? What do you recommend for right. our patients at home? So, like anything else, we have simple pain medications that are mm -hmm. available and some that are not so simple. Mm -hmm. But if we pull up slide 26, mm -hmm. in terms of what I can actually do for you, we do injections to the knees. Okay. That can be quite useful. Okay. And if you pull up 27. Okay. So, we Let's actually have there for a, a little bit. three different types of injections that are regularly used by orthopedic surgeons. Here in Trinidad. Indeed. All right. Uh, the most common one to yes. the left is the steroid injection. Yes, that's the most common. And then the one in the middle is becoming more popular and patients are coming to ask for it. It's a cartilage building injection. Mm -hmm. So, it's made up of hyaluronic acid. Mm -hmm. And then the one to the right is a little bit more recent. Mm -hmm. but it also has its uses and this is what we call PRP mm -hmm. and this is a version of stem cell treatment where we take the patient's own blood though so we're not using um, any other stem cell originating elsewhere. Mm -hmm. We utilize the patient's own blood, mm -hmm. place it in a centrifuge and spin it down mm -hmm. and then re-inject it into the knee okay. and this is thought to promote healing. All right. Um, 
Which one do you do, use, Trevor? I use all three. Mm -hmm. And basically, when you have a, a very swollen, angry looking knee, yeah. my go-to will most likely be the steroid injection. Yeah. To settle it now? That's correct. When you have a knee that's just had an injury, yeah. my go-to would actually be the blood injections because that promotes healing. All right. And then when you have mild to moderate arthritis and you're trying to build back up a little bit of cartilage, we yeah. use the cartilage building injection. All right. So let me, let me ask you something. The, um, yes, the steroid injection has been a long for, for a long time. Patients have been getting it in general practice for, for decades, right? Yeah. Um, with good relief. Um, but the, the PRP, that's the plasma, what is it? Platelet-enriched Platelet plasma. Platelet-enriched plasma. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that a little bit? Is that fairly new? How long has it been going on in Trinidad? So the, the actual science of it is, is, is quite old. And yeah. in years gone by when I was, well, probably not that long, hopefully, but I was first training, yeah. we actually just used to take patients' blood without spinning it down and, and inject it just like that. So the theory has back been around. Back into the joint space. Back into the joint space, yeah. So okay. theory has actually been around for a long time. Yeah. The problem with that very simple concept is yeah. the amount of blood it becomes painful. Yeah. And the red part of the blood is quite painful. So we okay. separate out the red part okay. and we use the white part. Right. So the PRP technology has been around worldwide for about 20 years. Right. And we've been doing it here in Trinidad for the last 10, 10 years or so. Okay. Um, as it's become more and more popular. Yeah. Some of you may be familiar with the fact that it's actually used for many things, including hair loss. Yeah. Um, so it has a, a broad base usage. Right. And basically any usage is directed at the fact that you're putting healing components of the blood cells in areas where healing is required. Right, for example, the knee. For example, the knee. So what does it do to the knee joint? That, that your own blood, your own white cells, when you put that component, what does it do to the actual joint? Well, does it cause it to heal, it to does, regenerate? It does, so the, 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 when blood flows through our, our bodies, yeah. the, the joints really don't get blood. The joints are very white, clean, shiny surfaces, and, and yeah. they, they get blood sort of seeping through. They don't really have blood supply to them. Right. So that when we use this PRP, a platelet enriched plasma, we're directly placing the healing components of In blood the within the joint. All right. And it's something we do typically on three doses on a weekly basis. Okay. Week one, week two, week three. Okay. So we sort of do an additive effect where we contribute and build up the um, healing cells within the, the knee or whichever joint or area. That and patients have gotten good responses? Yes. Okay. Um, you, in, in my opinion, we need to be a little bit careful uh -huh. and not one brush fits all. Yes. So, you know, if steroids will have certain uses, hyaluronic acid will have certain uses, and the, the PRP will have certain uses okay. as well. Okay. All right. Trevor, this is a good point for us to take a little break, and then we'll come back. So, guys, we're here with Dr. Trevor C. Paul. We're talking about orthopedics. We're talking about knee pain. And at this moment in time, I would like to formally invite you at home to send in your questions for Dr. C. Paul. Um, on the field of orthopedics, it doesn't necessarily have to be on the knees. Yeah. Um, we'll be discussing knee pain tonight. All right, guys? So we'll take a short break and we'll be right back. ACT and The Voice launches a new and versatile culinary series called Stacy's Kitchen. Hi everyone, welcome to Stacy's Kitchen. And on today's episode of Stacy's Kitchen, we will be cooking up a Thanksgiving feast. Our rolls are ready and looking yummy. Nothing like a good curry chicken and some basmati rice. So I'm going to start putting my wings in to fry. We will showcase how to make tasty international cuisine with our local products. We emphasize meals on a budget with our selected ingredients. Restez à l'écoute, Stacy's Cuisine. Au revoir. So you, you can put how much? Depends on how big you want it. So our fish is ready. Oh my God, look at that. Oh my God, oh my God. Just like paratha, this is lovely. Join us on ACTN on Monday evenings at 6.30 p.m. Don't miss Stacy's Kitchen, exclusively on ACTN The Voice. Ball 
101 is on every Tuesday and Thursday night at 9 p.m. I'm your host, Joshua DeMatos, and I'm joined by Nikolai Madri, Jeremy Bridgenap, and David Lucky. This is where you'll get all the football news that you need to know. Glamorize football to what it is. The viewership speaks for itself. At the end of the day, these guys are making billions on viewership. With heated banter. They'll have more trophies, more Premier League trophies, more Champions You are trophies talking past. You are talking past. I'm talking about current situation of the club. And trending discussions. Barcelona was built around Messi. But Messi created the most chances against Real Madrid in the Champions League. Covering all the major leagues. If you all don't win Europa, you can hold us. <laughs> this is the only cup you all are going to play. <laughs> to support their core coaches with the, with the kind of budget. I think you have somebody need delivering to some food for we, we need to get service like what? this on the show. <laughs> yeah, I can do some of that right now. It's about that time. Football 101, bringing the field to your home. You have the most assists right now. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Alright guys, welcome back to Your Health, Your Choice. My name is Dr. Robin Rupnarayan and I'm here with Dr. Trevor Sipol, orthopedic surgeon. And we're continuing our discussion on knee pain. So Trevor, um, we, left, we left off there with all the conservative treatments, right, with the knee braces. And we had reached to the point of the, the injection, the intra-articular, the intra-joint yes, injections. Yes. You went through steroid in shots. You went through the, the hyaluronic acid or, or the synvisc as we see it. That's right. And you discussed the, um, the pl is it platelet? Platelet. Platelet-rich platelet right. therapy, which sounds very um, interesting. So, Trevor, in those patients, now let us move on to, to let's say they're not settling down and they're still getting pain. Uh, what's the next treatment option for these guys? Well, we have quite a few surgical options that we mm -hmm. utilize, and, mm -hmm. and these range from doing keyhole surgery to clean up the joint, yeah. to surgery to realign the bones. Yeah. But in our setting, patients mostly put up with their pain to the point where they really need something done. You yeah. know, we, we don't like to see the doctors too early. So of we, course. we come a bit later here. Yeah. And for those patients, the vast majority, we start talking about whether or not they would like to have a, a knee replacement. Let, let me ask you something. Slide 30. What yeah. percentage of patients who have this right? What percentage of patients who move from the injections to needing surgery? Is it the majority of patients who need surgery? Is it a minority of the patients? Or is it just extremely hard to tell and it's a case by case? Uh, it's largely a case by pay, case, sorry. Yeah. And it's based on, on mindset. Yeah. You know, our population will, many of us will bear with our pain yeah. And we will modify our lifestyles, yeah. take a few pain medications rather than, than go under the, the surgeon's knife. Yeah. And, uh, and that's fine. You know, the, these conditions aren't life-threatening. Yeah. But as we become more demanding in our lifestyles and we perhaps want more and we want to enjoy the, the twilight years of course. a bit better, yeah. more and more people are moving towards having the knee replacement done so that okay. they could get out there and uh, enjoy life. And understand your answer. Um, it's about quality of life and how you want to move forward. Indeed. All right, so could you explain to us there? You said you wanted to pull up a slide. Sorry, slide before I interrupted 30. you. Slide 30 there, Josh. This is a knee replacement surgery. Should I have one? Well, generally, it really comes back to, as, as you said, if you, what your pain levels are like and your quality yeah. of life. Yeah. Um, in terms of my recommendation, I don't really recommend having a knee replacement because of the amount of arthritis you have. Yeah. The amount of arthritis really makes little difference to me. Yeah. Once you have a significant amount, yeah. then the choice becomes back to you. Yeah. It shouldn't really be the doctor's choice at that point. Yeah. You need to say whether the pain and inconvenience and the, the burden on your life is so great that you, you want to have something done. Right. And that something involves the lower end of the thigh bone yeah. at the knee joint, we remove that and the upper end of the shin bone, we remove that. Mm -hmm. And we replace it with metal components. Mm -hmm. And between these, we put a hard plastic liner. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of this is to allow for the hinge effect okay. and allow the knee to bend as close to normally as we can. All right. And that's uh, basically a new replacement? Basically. All right, so I saw something about cost then. It's, it's available in public hospitals, obviously, is it? Yes. So. Right. In Trinidad, is a huge uh, waiting list in the hospital for, for knee replacement? There is, unfortunately. Yeah. There is. Um, all the hospitals in Trinidad do offer 
Yeah. Some have a more refined service th than others. Right. Um, as, you, as you mentioned, I work at San Fernando. So, yeah. you know, before COVID occurred, we were doing about 140 hip and knee replacements per year, which is not bad. It's not great. 140? 140. Okay. You know, in the public service, right. free of charge. In San Fernando. In San Fernando. That's good. Um, COVID put a span in that works, but we're hoping yeah. to get back up to those levels. Right. And um, for those who can afford, the private sector also offers the, the, the service. All right. Um, so let me ask you, um, when somebody goes for this knee, knee replacement surgery, I mean, the main question patients will ask me if they're going to consider to get knee replacement surgeries. Robin, um, what's it going to be like? How long I'll be down? Is it major surgery? What's the risk of the surgery? Um, just real briefly, if you could just explain mm -hmm. that. So those patients at home might be waiting to go for the replacement <laughs> surgery. At least if you could give them the information, so maybe they'll be comfortable on, 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 and so on. But know? let's see if I can give as much information as concisely, concisely as possible. Concisely, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. So you come for your knee replacement, we work you up, we make sure it's the right thing for you, you bring you in hospital. Yeah. When you come in hospital, you have your operation on that day. Yeah. The next day, we will expect you to walk. Not walk okay. alone, but you walk okay. with assistance. Our physiotherapist will get you up using a walking frame. Okay. You will spend about three to four days in hospital. Okay. Just getting used to the knee, starting to move around. All right. We'll give you some antibiotics, pain medication. We'll make sure you're okay. Okay. When you leave hospital, we would expect you to even be able to clear some stairs when you get home. This if is only four to fifth day. That's right. All right. Very good. Now we wouldn't expect you to be walking up and down these stairs. No, no. All right, but, but, but it's, it's mobility right away. Indeed. And we ask that for the first two weeks, at least you have somebody there to look after you, cook your meals, make sure when you go to the toilets and bathroom, you could say, yeah. I'm going to the bathroom and, yeah. and these sorts of things. At two weeks, the stitches come out, physiotherapy takes place. At six weeks, those of you who drive or have relatively simple jobs that don't involve too much weight bearing and, and activity needs can return to work. And activities. Um, and. After that six weeks period, the recovery continues, but most would have happened by about six weeks, and then by about six months, you really get to know the knee, right. and you would have feel well. Yes, this is what I have. Now. Back to normal. Yeah. All right. And the well, pain hopefully is better than normal. Better than normal. <laughs> exactly. So the pain is it's more or less. What do patients report? What do the patients report? Satis high satisfaction in terms of pain levels and mobility yeah. with a knee replacement? We look at about 85% true success. Okay, um, that's good. Yeah, it's yeah. not bad at all. Yeah. Uh, some patients still have degrees of pain afterwards, okay. but 85% of true success. All right, cool. Um, so we're going to move on a little bit now, um, Trevor. We're going to move on to the under 60s. Because there's a whole category of patients. So, I mean, what is it, why, why do our, our young people, so to speak, uh, talking about the under 60s and over 21s, why, why would they need to see an orthopedic surgeon with knee pain? Well, what is the common causes in that age group? We've become very active. Weekend warriors. Weekend warriors, um, mm -hmm. sports individuals. Allegedly. Uh, in the alleged sports mm -hmm. individuals. And um, we have a sort of women as well are more participating in sports a lot more. Correct. And These they are the part-timers we're talking about, the amateurs, indeed, not the professionals. Indeed. Yeah. Um, and in terms of the, the injuries that we get, if we put up slide 16, mm -hmm. so we would often get twisting type injuries, whether it's from playing football mm -hmm. or simply sort of running around playing cricket or you just get a twist. Mm -hmm. And the menisci, these are two areas of soft tissue cartilage that act mm -hmm. like cushions. Right. So the two little cushions that yeah. sit between the thigh bone and the shin bone at the level of the knee. Yeah. And these cushions are designed to really absorb the shock and load. Right. But when we have twisting injuries, what can happen is we can get tears to these menisci. Yeah. And these tears can become painful. Yeah. And the body has a certain capacity to heal some of them back. Right. But sometimes we do need to resort to a surgical solution right. in order to tidy or, or repair these tears that can right. occur. So these would be the most common. Mm -hmm. And in, in these cases, I usually give them time to let the body heal themselves. Mm -hmm. They can be aided by the PRP, same platelet okay. injections that we spoke about because of the healing component. Right. Um, steroids, yes, as well, have a, have a place to, to play. Yeah. And then the surgery for these would be keyhole surgery. Yeah, which is called arthroscopy. Arthroscopy. Mm -hmm. And what do you do in the arthroscopy to help them? 
So in the, when we do the arthroscopy for the meniscal surgery, mm -hmm. there are basically two types of things we can do. We can either repair the tear mm -hmm. or we can trim the tear back to what we call a stable rim. Mm -hmm. So the, the pain actually comes from the tear flapping around. That's where you get pain. That's correct. So mm -hmm. you either repair that flap back mm -hmm. or you excise the flap so it, it looks pretty, but it's a little, a little smaller than when it started. All right. So is the meniscal injury the most common type of injury in, in that age group from yes. sports? All right. Yes. What's the other type of injury you get? Well, we would be amiss if we didn't talk about the, the ACL. I think we'd be very amiss <laughs> if we didn't talk about ACL. We must talk about the anterior cruciate yeah. ligament, so slide yeah. 15. And the anterior cruciate ligament, those of you who play football or avidly watch football will be relatively familiar with it mm -hmm. because many footballers suffer this injury. Mm -hmm. And it's a ligament that resides in the, in the center of the knee yeah. and contributes significantly to the stability of the knee. Yeah. And when you get a, a nasty tackle, as you can see in the picture there, yeah. or if you have a very nasty twisting type injury, yeah. you can rupture this anterior cruciate ligament. Right. And this ligament does not heal very well at all. Yeah. I see you have on that slide can be a life-changing injury. Indeed. What do you mean by that? Uh, I mean, it's kind of self-explanatory, but, <laughs> but I mean, can we not help them or, or what, what's, why, why, what happens? What's so, taking the football example again, yeah. many of you will know of, avid fans will know of footballers who've had these ACL injuries. Yeah. Some of them come back and some of them you don't hear from okay. anymore again. Right. So, it's really professional athletes, sometimes it could end their career. It could end their career. It okay. can be a career-ending injury. All right. um, and for weekend warriors as well too. It, it, it can be life-changing okay. because you can't run around as, as you used to. The knee tends to give way. It right. feels unstable. Right. Yeah. And um, so, so the, with the meniscal injuries, you go in there, you, you sort of repair or trim down the, the flapping part. And what do you do for the ACL or the anterior cruciate ligament injuries, which is common in footballers? So once again, we would use the, the arthroscopic or keyhole type surgery. Yeah. And we will actually have to reconstruct the ligament by borrowing some tissues from elsewhere. Yeah. And most commonly what we would borrow is we would borrow what most people know of the hamstring tendons. Yeah. So we would borrow the hamstring tendons and actually implant that into the knee right. in order to replace or reconstruct what was previously the ACL ligament. Okay. Um, I just, I just think about a professional athlete, all right, or even a, a non-professional athlete. So they have this surgery done. Is surgery the only option? Because I've heard stories about them, um, especially one particular Trinidadian um, international who didn't have surgery for his knee. And he eventually had to have it, mm. but he actually played one or two games without, um, without having surgery done with, with, a, with, a, with a, a sort of ruptured ACL. It depends on the level of instability. Right. So once you have instability yeah, it has to be and done. you wish to play sport, it has to be done. It has to be done. All right. And um, what's the what's the outcome in terms of what surgery is not the end, end all. You can't just have surgery day one and go back out and play football day two. So what happens in the interval after surgery? So the timeline really, if you want to play football, having had an ACL injury yeah. or play any sort of contact or active sport is about six months. Okay. So you're looking at a six month recovery. Yeah. Um, in to simply return to work, you're looking at about six weeks. Right. To return to, return to, to work. To return to work, you're looking at right. about six weeks. So they're at home for six weeks, weeks, basically. Depending on their job, you know, if yeah. they can go with crutches to work and, okay. and they don't need to move around right. too much. So after surgery, the patient is on crutches for six they're weeks? They're on crutches, partial, what we call partial weight bearing. Okay. You can't sort of just walk independently okay. and um, go about your business. So they're, they're at home resting in the, uh, until that point? Physiotherapy. Physiotherapy. And... and not necessarily rest, but physiotherapy is important to get okay. back the movement and strength. And then after six weeks, they're able to go back out to the job yes. if you're non-active, non-footballer, non -active. Non -non for example. And how do you take that, that person now back to playing sport? So we, we graduate along that time. So at six weeks, we, we start to be a little bit more active. Mm -hmm. At around sort of two to three months, we start doing sort of more treadmill work. Yeah. If you're going very well at about four months, you start doing some sort of running, light running. Right. And, and sort of building up gradually towards the actual sporting activity at around six okay. months. Okay, all right. 
I want to see outcome for patients that do have these surgeries. And because um, we have a lot of um, people go out there and try that. They're fairly active. They go and play football as a teenager or in their early 20s. Um, they get injured. Um, it's not a career for them. They kind of go back out to the normal job. Some of them don't treat the injuries surgically. What's the problem there? What happens there? The, is there a problem not treating it surgically? Well, in terms of the outcome, the success yeah. rates are very good for, for ACL surgery. Okay. You know, and they're easily above 80% in terms of success. What do you mean success. by success? That again, back to your original, back, back to into function? The, not necessarily the competitive sport, yeah. but getting back into some sort of active sport or active lifestyle. Okay. With turning. Yeah. With turning. Right. Yeah. Um, so the, the success rates are, are quite good. Now, it is thought and indeed partially true that if you don't have your ACL repaired, you're going to advance, have advanced arthritis of the knee sooner rather than later. Is that so? It is to a point. Um, there's also the philosophy that the damage is actually done at the initial injury. And that's it. So both, both things are true. Okay. I think both things contribute to each other. Okay. There is definitely some damage done at the initial injury. Right. And if your knee is particularly unstable, you will get arthritis okay. before your, your time, basically. All right. So that's the ACL injuries for the footballers, the meniscal ligament, in, the meniscus injuries, also for the footballers and the cricketers. Um, are there any other causes of knee pain in the, in the younger populations? Yes. And if we put up slide nine, this is uh, in particular with, with the men and women, but somewhat more with the, with the women. Yes. And they develop what we call patellofemoral pain yeah. or early patellofemoral arthritis yeah. or early wear and tear. But the terminology is variable, but effectively what they get is bruising on the underside of the kneecap. Mm -hmm. And the reason it happens more to, to women is yeah, we, we admire the shape of women. You know, we talk about the Coca-Cola shape. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem with the Coca-Cola shape is it's not as mechanically refined right. as the more straight shape that, that men have right. or the straight alignment. So, uh -huh. And because of that, the kneecaps tend to run or track awkward, a little bit more awkwardly in women. Right. And especially if they're very active in, in sporty type things, mm -hmm. then they tend to suffer some bruising on the underside of, of the kneecap area. Okay. Uh, I, the technical term is sort of chondromalacia patella in, in the young, or we sort of so, just say wear and tear on the underside or bruising right. on the underside of the kneecap. And more common in women. Yes. And how do you treat that? That can be quite difficult to treat mm -hmm. um, because cartilage, especially on the kneecap, isn't very responsive to treatment. All right. But we work on directing and strengthening the muscles and getting the knee tracking a bit better. All right. And then in terms of injections, we offer the the PRP, yes, platelet, as before. a healing potential, mm -hmm. and or the synvisc hyaluronic acid can also be, be useful. Okay. All right. And some modification activity. So, for example, you know, if you're going all out, just tone back a little bit. So avoid things like deep squats, bench press, rowing machines. Mm -hmm. yeah, but you can still use skiing machines, treadmill, and okay. the other weights. So, so just tone it back a bit. Back, right. back a bit. Good, Trevor. So uh, we're going to take a little break again. All right. So, guys, uh, we're taking a little break here with Dr. To Trevor Sepoil. And we, again, you know, send in your questions or your comments for Dr. Trevor, and he'll answer it as best as you can. All right, so we'll be back shortly. ACTN The Voice welcomes you to join us for our newest agricultural television series, Harvest. Welcome to Harvest. We're doing it double again, north and south. This morning, we start here in Brazil Village on Bethany Estate with Michael and Jacinta Mill. You can look forward to a personalized tour around scenic Trinidad and Tobago, showcasing different agricultural practices and teaching us self-sustenance. So, Wendy, you're about to show me your bromeliad house. Yes. Oh, this is lovely. This is this is what our customers refer to as the mecca for bromeliads. Explore the many ways to make your harvest right for you. So our chicken coop is more or less built at, uh, built at a height whereby it's easy for us to go and just remove the, the wood shavings into our barrow. Now, you know, plant out your seedlings, you buy the seedlings, yes. right? People just have seedlings. Here we are on a not quite monocrop site, but we have rows of tomatoes, 
rows of sweet peppers, and then you have the mills polyculturing. Join us every Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Harvest, a new dimension in agriculture. You're watching ACTN, The Voice. Connect with ACTN The Voice on Facebook or Instagram at ACTN The Voice. ACTN The Voice, your family-friendly station. Uh, yeah. Alright guys, welcome back. We're here with Dr. C. Paul and we're talking knee pain orthopedics. So Doc, um, so we went through the elderly, the over 65s, if you could call that elderly. We went through the younger, the ones, the under 60s, the sort of um, younger people that may be injured in sports. Um, very importantly though, how about children under 18s? Do they get knee pain a lot? Do you see a lot of those in your practice? We, we do or see. Or let's, let's say leg pain, knee or lower limb pain. Do you see that in, in kids? Yeah, we, we do see a fair amount. Okay. Um, what could be the cause of kids. Uh, if we put up slide 21, um, this shows you in, in orthopedics and medicine as a whole, we, we like to name things after ourselves. So when people discover things, <laughs> they name it after themselves. So right. Osgood and Schlatter's right. uh, name of the people who discovered this condition. Yeah. But basically this is pain at the front of the knee, yeah. just, be, just be literally below the knee. That yeah. knobbly bit, we call that the tibial tuberosity there. Yes. So that knobbly bit just below. Yeah. And especially in our growing kids, yeah. They, they run around a lot and they play a lot. Mm -hmm. And this area is one of the, the growing areas of the bone. Right. And this can become painful in those children that run around a lot, play some play some football, cricket, or whatever the case may be. Right. And you said 10 to 14 year olds. Yes. So okay. it's our, our teenagers who are sort of young teenagers right. who are their growth spurts. We right. will feel that pain and experience that there. And what do we do for those kids with well, that kind of pain? Is it all conservative? Or? Thankfully for us, yeah. But they don't like it. They have to rest up for a few months. Okay, months? Uh, yes. Oh, wow. About three months, four months. Oh, my gosh. Uh, you don't need a cast. You don't need to, to, to stay bandaged up. Yeah. But you just say stay off the sports for about three months or okay. so. And it settles down. And just one. let it settle back down. Right. Yes, but the kids really don't like to, um, to hear that. Yeah. You, you use a phrase there um, just now. You said um, green, green spoots and stuff, right? Yes. Uh, I don't know, is it is it old housewives tale? Is it true or not? Um, you know, sometimes people say the kids get pains at, at, at growing spurts and they get joint pains and growing pains. Is that a real thing, a true thing, or is that just one of those Trinidadian tales? Well, it, it does sound very abstract, but yes. it, and you, it's very difficult to prove. Yeah. But yes, in my experience, and I haven't seen quite a few children with these growing pains, yeah. they do seem to get it. Yeah. And you know, they will have pains for a few months in their shins mostly yeah. or in their thighs. Yeah, shins is a common area for it. And you know, their, their parents have to rub them down and give them some Panadol syrup at night. Yeah. And the, the, the good thing about it from a, a parental and a doctor's point of view, yeah. it is very unlikely that there's anything seriously wrong with your child if they're having the same problem on both sides. Okay. So usually, you know, if you're going to have a serious problem, it's going to be one-sided. I, I get your point, yeah. And the fact that it's symmetrical yeah. it kind of puts us at ease that yes, yes, it, it, it's growing pains. Yeah. Sometimes you do x-rays just to be sure and, and to prove it. Yeah. But, but what, um, what exactly happens in the bone that makes it, well, we, that, that causes this pain and we refer to it as growing pains? I'm afraid your guess is as good as <laughs> We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. So um, something happens anyway. And um, so it's not just related. To, and the kids get this pain and just rest it, some regular paracetamol, I should settle down. Yes. All right. Um, at what point in time should a parent become, become concerned if the child is getting leg pain? Because we can't put down, we can't put down everything to growing pains. No. 
when should a, because uh, when should a parent become concerned and when should a parent come into you with a kid getting leg pain? So especially if it's one-sided yeah, or as localized, you said before, yeah. that, that's important. Yeah. Um, if you find yourself giving the child Panadol syrup every single night yeah. for a week or two, yeah. if the child has a fever, yeah. or is generally un unwell, that, yeah. that can be a sign of, of a, a more major problem. Right. And obviously if something is, is persistent and then affecting the child's day, so yeah. if they're limping around during yeah, the day. Yeah, you want to see the child then? Yes. All right. Yes. And to, to see whether it's anything more in, more in depth in the bone that could be causing the problem. That's right. And thankfully the more in depth causes are, are relatively rare, but okay. it, it would be important as a parent if these things do arise, yeah. as we discussed there. Yeah, we certainly don't want you just to ignore it as a patient, as a parent. Quite right. Um, we have one or two questions coming in now. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to get some feedback from the public and, and see what it's thinking. Course. All right, Trevor. So, um, Josh, you can go ahead and, and put up any questions you have. Yep. Um, can you address the emergence, emergence of Baker's cysts? Good question. Why it happens, how to treat with it? That's a good question. That's, a, that's something very, we see. Very good question. We see a lot in general practice. It's sort of big assist or swelling behind the, um, the knee. Can you, can you just, um, just give them a, a brief explanation of what is basic assist and how to treat it? So generally a big assist is a response to something else. It's not that the big assist is the problem per se. Okay. So typically these patients will have some degree of arthritis. Yeah. Or they may have a meniscal tear that we talked right. about. So the because this is actually a swelling behind the knee, right? That's correct. Right. Yes. We, want we should have, I should have said that. That's yes, right. It's That's swelling right. behind the knee. So the, when you have some sort of injury from a meniscus mm -hmm. or early arthritis, mm -hmm. you have a buildup of fluid in the knee. Mm -hmm. And what can happen is that fluid can actually find itself sequestered or contained at the back of the knee. Right. And it doesn't seem to want to escape. It finds itself in a pouch. Yeah. And, and that pouch constitutes the Baker's cyst. Okay. Now, in terms of what to do about it, they can be quite painful. Yeah. And the treatment of such pain medication, weight, um, NSAID sort of anti-inflammatory medication. And grip as well? Bandages can be of, of some help. All right. Uh, but what you really need to do is address, address the underlying cause. All right. And uh, would the cyst go away on its own no time? They often do. Okay. They often do. Yeah. Um, steroid injections can be quite useful here, All either right. into the knee itself or the cyst. All right. So, I mean, if you have to tell, just tell the viewer there that it's probably something, nothing, nothing dangerous. No. Um, nothing to really worry about. Um, well, it is, it's a cause, a concern of what actually caused the extra secretion of fluid, but might be arthritis or overuse, and then you address that as your primary concern. Yeah. Uh, is that right? So, Josh, we have any other questions coming up there? Good. Sean, should someone with arthritis continue leg workout at the gym? And should one keep the workout light or can I go heavy? That's a very practical question. Very, very practical so question. Like, uh, we're not sure the guy's age. Yes. Which, um, and we're not sure, but let's say he has arthritis in the leg. Let's, uh, let's say it's a 60 year old and he's, he's keeping active. Can he continue doing his weights and doing his squats and doing his, his, his leg presses, that kind of stuff? I try to encourage people to remain active. Yeah. Um, but you do need to think about modifying certain things. So you yeah. mentioned leg press and squats. Yeah. Those are two things that probably are not ideal for somebody with arthritis. Exactly, yeah. Um, that doesn't mean that they, you can't use much of the other equipment in the gym. Yeah. And it also doesn't mean that you can't lift weights. Yeah. Now, if you're gonna do deep squats and hope to rise up on arthritic knees, you're going to cause yourself some distress. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, in my, my, um, my experience, um, Trevor, that the, the main purpose of going to the gym is you'd really, you want to strengthen the muscles around the knee. Um, you That's want to get right. those thigh muscles nice and strong. You want to get your calves nice and strong. You want to keep your mobility and your flex flexibility good. You want to test it out. But the main purpose of actually going in the gym and physiotherapy, I think, is to get the muscles that support the, the joint strong. And um, this is a, I actually saw this in my office today as well. The, the exercises that you do at the gym sometimes, your form is very important because no matter what, your exercises are not meant to put pressure on the joint. That's right. Right? So if you're doing an exercise and, you, and, 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 and you're getting back pain, or you're putting, nobody, uh, deadlift and, and squats is not, not actually knee exercises. Those are leg exercises. And if you're getting plenty pains in the knee, you have to watch your form and maybe drop down a bit of the weight. 
yeah, to maintain yeah. proper form. All right? So nobody's a hero there. And form, as you say, form is very, very More important, important. than the weight. Very, very More important, important than the weight to use. So we have a, a, a crowd of questions flying in now. So let's get the next one there, um, Josh. After an ACL surgery, would that knee ever be as strong as the knee was before the injury? I kind of ask that question. I don't know where this man coming from. <laughs> um, we've seen Trinidadian footballers, and I'm calling any name. Let's find it wasn't the same after the ACL injury. You know, it wasn't didn't have the spark. Mm. Um, we see some guys go back; they were good. Um, the famous one is Brazilian Ronaldo. Mm. Um, he, I think, he had about three or four. He was never the same. Um, some people say it's fair. Some people say that, you know. Is that person ever the same after an ACL injury, that athlete? I think the fairest answer to that is, is no. Okay. And, and that's because the a few reasons. One, we do actually get other injuries with the ACL. Right. And why, that's why I said the, the injury kind of writes itself at the time. Right. In terms of promoting arthritis later on. Right. So we get meniscal tears often with the ACL and we get other ligamentous injuries. Right. So even though we repair the ACL. Yeah. It, it doesn't necessarily fix everything absolutely back to normal. All right. And then we're relying on our surgeons as well to, to pinpoint that ACL into its exact location that it right. was before. Right. And that is, is, is difficult to, to do, do and, and represent. All right. Um, obviously, experience helps, but right. it, it doesn't mean it's going to be exactly how it was before. before. And how about the functionality of the, of the athlete? Are they able to cut and turn and, and, and dribble down the left wing? And then cut in towards gold as before? Well, once again, I said some, some are able to carry on, some are not. Right. But the, uh, many Think. do actually re return to high level sport, as you would have seen uh, and pointed out. All right. So, um, yeah, yeah, yes, you are. Um, certainly not the same after, no. Um, but some people could return to a large degree of functionality and, and functionability, and some can't. And I suppose the level of physiotherapy that you do and, and the quality of physiotherapy is very important as well for, for persons who want to go back to active sport. Yeah, Josh, you could put forward the next um, question. Should I continue to wear my knee brace for the rest of my life when I okay football after ACL surgery? When I play football after ACL Should I continue to wear my knee brace for the rest of my life? When I play football after ACL surgery, huh? Yeah, you're getting drifted. That question. I, I, I do. Yeah, yeah, I, think, I think that's a very good there, question. Right. Yeah. And I think the simplest answer to that is yes. Okay. Yeah, during football and and sporting activities, you're better off wearing a brace if you're extra support for those type of activities. Yeah. yeah. All right. So you have a next question, there, Josh. Yeah. I did an ACL surgery. See, ACL was a very, a very popular. Um, <laughs> very popular indeed. Unless it's the same viewer. <laughs> <laughs> I did an ACL surgery like years ago, and to this day, every time I bend my knee, it makes a cracking sound. Is that okay? Is that okay? Well, what's it, up with that? What's it, up with that cracking the sound? The question travel? would be: Is it is it painful or, or is it not painful? Right. Um, knees crack for various reasons. It's um, non-painful. Non-painful. Yeah. Then and Josh just whispered in my ear. Right. Yeah. Most likely, that's not too too much of a problem. Right. Um, it, it, once you can carry on and, and do what you need to do, right. and the cracking is often quite disturbing from the sound and, and the feel. Yeah. But for most of them that is, aren't is, painful, is that what you call crepitus in your knee? Is it? No? Yeah, not so much crepitus. Okay. That's fine. But you you can have bands within the knee. Right. Bands of tissue that snap. Snap, okay. And, and that snapping can be felt and, and even heard sometimes as quite a loud click. All right. So that so you're saying that, that the patient shouldn't worry too much about that if you are? Shouldn't worry too much um, mm -hmm. if it's becoming painful okay. or, or if it starts swelling up. Yeah. Then probably a bit more concerning and may, might need some more assessment. Uh, yeah. But if it's that long after and you've been doing relatively well otherwise, well... Yeah. Yeah. Take, take that blessing. I think you had a good surgeon in I that case. I think so, yeah. <laughs> I think you had to take that going into the surgery. Yeah. Um, and you can probably next two questions there, Josh. I know we have four more minutes left. So we'll take the final two. Hi, doctor. I'm having severe knee pain in my left knee. Sometimes I cannot even walk. Can I get some information on how to contact you? All right, well, we'll put up that at the end of the... Um, Josh, you'll put up the doctor's information at the, end of the, um, at the end of the program. You can put up the next question. Good night. Can you come off statin? Because I understand you can get diabetes using 
statin. I just had heart surgery, but I don't, but I don't want later on to get diabetes and then kidney problems. All right, so not really related to orthopedics <laughs> there, Josh, but that's fine. Um, you can come off a of statin once your cholesterol is fine. Um, there have been some reports that statins may predispose you to diabetes, mm. um, but a statin is a very important medication. As Dr. Bahal said last week when you were saying, statins and aspirin are the hallmark treatment of cardiac illness and ischemic heart disease. So it's not a simple question, and it's not, um, the answer will probably be no until you've been cleared by a cardiologist um, in order to do so. Um, and yes, you just continue monitoring your risk of diabetes with that. Um, but aspirin and statins are the most important treatments for, and, and, and for very important hormone treatments for cardiac disease. Um, any more questions there, Josh? <clears throat> All right, cool. So. Um, Trevor, that's one last question before we run off, sure. right? We have about two minutes, but I want to push it. Um, not really related to knees. No problem. Carpal tunnel syndrome. What exactly is carpal tunnel syndrome? Because I heard a lot of patients complain about numbness in their hands and tingling. Um, if you could just tell me what the treatments that you would use so I could help my patients as well in my uh, office. Very common, and it's because of pressure on the nerve just about here. Yeah. And the treatments consist of some of the simple things, pain medications, gels, um, physiotherapy has a small role to play, right. splinting of the hand, Right. so especially at night, because what happens at night, we end up doing various things, yeah. and the, the nerve gets under extra pressure, so simple yeah. splints on the hand can actually help at night. Okay. And in, in terms of taking it, it further, steroid injections can be useful in okay. the sort of ones that aren't chronic, yes. so you know, less than six months steroid injections can be useful for them. Okay. But once you have ongoing severe tingling, and especially if you start okay. to get weakness in the hand, yeah. you're really looking at a surgical solution. Uh, thankfully, it's a simple surgery. Um, some, you know, some people are very afraid of surgery, but it's a simple surgery mm. that's conducted over, just in this area mm. under local anesthetic. All right, cool. So with that, we'll wrap it up, Trevor. All right, um, it's been a, a very um, interesting and useful and informative hour tonight, and I would just like to thank you for coming in studio. You presented the information in a very easy, easy to understand, fluid way. And um, yeah, we'd just like to thank you very much for that tonight. Yeah. Thank you, Robin. The pleasure has been all mine. And thanks to all the viewers and the questions. All right, and the information. I enjoyed it very much. On the screen. <laughs> all right, guys. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> thank you all at home for joining in tonight. Um, thank you to those viewers that sent in your questions. We appreciate it very much. And uh, we'll see you again next week. Take care. Have a pleasant evening, everyone. God bless. We'll see you again next week. Good night.